All right, if you've been following the news at all, you've probably heard about the bourbon scandal plaguing the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission. But if not, the gist is that for years, top OLCC officials diverted some of the most sought after bourbon away from customers and kept it for themselves. I'm Elena Neal Sachs, and this is Beat Check with the Oregonian. Today, I'm talking to the journalist who broke the bourbon scandal story and has been following it for the last couple of weeks. Oregonian Enterprise reporter Noel Crombie. Noel, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So, first things first, for listeners who haven't read your stories yet, can you give kind of the Spark Notes version of what exactly has been going on at the OLCC? Yeah. Um, let's start at the beginning of this uh, story, which b- began l- early last year with a departing. OLCC employee. And for starters, OLCC is a state agency that regulates um, uh, alcohol and cannabis in uh, liquor and cannabis in Oregon. It's one of 17 so-called control states, which exert some form of a monopoly over uh, liquor um, distribution and sales. And this departing employee wrote an email to uh, someone in HR saying, uh, you know, citing a number of grievances among them that higher ups were getting uh, liquor uh, set aside for themselves. And that led to a internal HR investigation uh, within the agency. And that investigation found or implicated six employees, people who are operating at the highest levels of the agency, including Steve Marks, the longtime executive director, who had at some point um, set aside a bottle or bottles from what the state calls its safety stock or reserve stock of, of this really scarce bourbon. And those were bottles or that's a supply that the state had set aside as sort of a backup um, in case there was breakage or loss in the shipments of these scarce bourbons around the state and and those that were used in the state's chance to purchase lottery. And they were considered sort of, for lack of a better word, I guess, leftovers. And um, those are the bottles that uh, these individuals had uh, sought to set aside for themselves. Um, That investigation took place over last summer. It ended uh, sometime in late summer. And the people involved, all six of them, uh, ended up with reprimands that took place uh, in December and January. Um, And so that's sort of the um, background yeah, so you broke this story that ended up being picked up by, you know, national outlets like the New York Times, Washington Post. Um you, you found out about this kind of like you said, at least it sounds like from this internal investigation. And so when you read through the investigative findings that showed top officials kind of, you know, reserving or taking some of the the bourbon, what did you do next? Like if you could kind of just walk me through that early stage of your reporting process a bit? Sure. Um, I sought the request, I sought the report through um, from the state, first with the Department of Administrative Services, which serves as a kind of um, statewide kind of clearinghouse um, administrator of state government. And I started there thinking that DAS might have been involved or had a copy or would be part of a review of this, particularly this magnitude. Um, And I did not have any luck uh, with my public records request uh, through DAS. And then I sought it directly from the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, excuse me, the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission. It was previously known uh, before it took on marijuana in its portfolio. It was known as Oregon Liquor Control and now it's Oregon Liquor and Cannabis. Um, And the agency released the report And it's a really damning uh, report in in that we're talking about people who are charged with carrying out the state's uh, regulatory functions on on liquor, who it was found during the course of this investigation and by the fact finder um, that they had used their position to gain um, something of value, in this case, bourbon. And, you know, it was immediately clear that this was a really significant um, 
investigation. It was a really significant revelation about the agency and, and perhaps, uh, you know, the culture within the agency. And uh, there were, it raised a lot of questions uh, right off the bat. Um, one of the people interviewed um, cited that, you know, he, he, he described not only the set aside from the, the uh, safety stock, but also um, he, he mentioned a kind of more common practice of, you know, he was serving as a facilitator and connecting people with uh, liquor. Um, and it's, it's not entirely clear from the interview what liquor he's referring to. I don't think that it pertains to the safety stock, but it's not really clear. It sounds like this employee is referring to just people contact him and, and ask him to um, fulfill their uh, requests for what may be more widely available liquor and have it sent to you know store A or store B. So there were kind of two different things that emerged, these two different um, scenarios that we wanted to learn more about. In particular, uh, this manager mentioned that he had performed this um, service, you know, hundreds of times in the years that he held the position, and he named lawmakers as among those who sought his services. And so that, of course, raised a lot of questions, uh, raised a lot of questions for readers, certainly who, um, you know, I heard from many readers who wanted to know what what is this reference about? And are, were lawmakers part of this? And so, you know, it's not clear from the report. The report, the investigator uh, remained focused on this particular manager's use for him of benefiting himself. Um, and so, this lawmaker aspect, there's no elaboration uh, within the report. So we, this week, I and, and late last week, emailed every sitting lawmaker um, who was in office last year when this practice was apparently, we, we think it may have stopped, um, that um, you know, we asked them a series of questions if they had ever requested or obtained liquor uh, from OLCC, um, had they ever had a bottle sent to a store, had they ever uh, received a bottle from Steve Marks. And um, many, many lawmakers responded immediately with categorical denials. Um, a handful of others um, declined to comment, citing the what is now a criminal investigation by the attorney general. And um, another half dozen or so just ignored the email. Yeah. So as you reported, the OLCC's former now director, Steve Marks, resigned Wednesday, and then the chair of the commission, Paul Rosenbaum, resigned a day later. Uh, who all at this point has been implicated in this so far? Because it seems like it's kind of getting bigger, like at, almost every day. There were six people named in this investigative report. Uh, all of them received reprimands that went into their personnel file. Those are people who oversee key functions of the agency, finances um, and administrative duties within the agency, including the deputy director and the director. Before this report became public, uh, the governor asked for Steve Marks to step down. And her office has subsequently said that that, that decision or that request came before her knowledge of this investigation. So we know that you know Steve Marks was was kind of already on his way out the door. Steve Marks is the you know longtime director of the agency, was a former chief of staff under uh, you know, former Governor John Kitzhaber. He had led uh, OLCC for about nine years, um, led the agency as it took on you know legal cannabis. And he, after the governor asked for his resignation, he did, he said he, you know, would resign um, and then stayed on for a couple of weeks. And even as this controversy sort of engulfed the agency, he remained um, on the job. And then uh, this week on Monday said that he would, uh, he would leave as of Wednesday. Uh, Mr. Rosenbaum, who's the chair of the commission, the way this organization or agency is set up is there's a citizen volunteer panel that um, 
doesn't manage the agency on the day to day, but but it it helps set policy and is an oversight uh, board. Uh, there's several agencies in the state that have such a setup, um, and these folks are appointed by the governor. In this case, all of these, all seven members of this panel are appointees of uh, former Governor Kate Brown, including uh, the chair uh, who had been appointed uh, in 2017. And you know, we have tried, or I have tried um, to reach Chair Rosenbaum many, many times uh, to ask um, you know, what he knew about this, you know, what steps he took once he learned of it, if he did learn of it, and, you know, whether he was even aware of this, this practice, um, if he had ever, you know, benefited from it himself. And, you know, he never answered us, always referred us to the spokesperson for the agency who did not uh, answer these questions directly. And then on Wednesday, uh, the commission met for its first time publicly, and, uh, Chair Rosenbaum delivered a very de- a sort of defiant um, and and at times uh, contradictory or somewhat confusing a defense of the commission and its actions. He said no one knew anything. Um, and I, I think he was referring to the practice of setting aside bottles of safety stock, but it's, it's unclear what he, what he was actually referring to. He did not address this issue sort of head on and in any way. And then he also said he actually was aware of, of the investigation. As of September 8th, he said he was informed of it by um, Rich Evans, who is a retired Oregon State Police Superintendent who holds a director position over uh, licensing and compliance within the agency. And he said he was briefed on it there have been kind of conflicting reports of, of that as well um, over the last week. But on Wednesday, at least, Chair Rosenbaum said that he he knew about it. And it sounded like he was aware that Steve Marks was implicated in it because he said that was the reason why Rich Evans had been tasked with carrying out the, the reprimands. And, you know, he said that the commission had done nothing wrong. And you know, obviously, this is an issue. This is, you know, an age. This is a revenue generating juggernaut of an agency for the state, in a sign of how important or how closely the governor is watching this agency. You know, her press secretary was there when um, the commission met, um, and you know, the following day, the governor asked the chair to step down. And you know, the governor's office isn't isn't elaborating on that request, only confirming that, in fact. Uh, Governor Kotek did ask for the chair's resignation. The governor has chosen um, a longtime sort of manager in state government to um, take on the interim role at the agency, Craig Prinz, who uh, formerly led the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission, uh, and, which is kind of a clearinghouse for statewide criminal justice statistics. And then um, he went on to serve as inspector general at the Department of Corrections, which is kind of the internal watchdog for the Department of Corrections. And he's held that position for a number of years. Um, and uh, he was tapped to step in here to um, OLCC. I spoke with Mr. Prince briefly at the meeting on Wednesday and asked him, you know, what are his you know, priorities going into this job? And he said only that uh, you know, he was going into it with his eyes wide open and that, you know, his first job would be to read the internal report, um, which kind of spells out what exactly was going on within the agency. Right. So kind of zooming out a bit, wh- where do you think, from your perspective reporting on this, where does the OLCC go from here? Like, has this whole situation made policymakers and just maybe people in Oregon in general rethink the way the state controls the sale of liquor? Because it, I mean, as you mentioned, it's not every state does this. Um, It's kind of a unique setup to begin with. Yeah. I mean, there have been uh, debates and discussions about privatizing um, this system. And, you know, some people I've spoken with in the past week, political observers and lobbyists have said, you know, they feel like this might present the opportunity to re-examine the way the state, you know, regulates liquor. 
also in the audience on Wednesday were a number of uh, what are called liquor agents. These are people who are operating these state regulated stores that sell liquor. And they, um, at least the people I spoke with, were very, you know, were very keen on preserving the, the status quo and the way the state um, operates uh, now. And, you know, they were looking for a signal from the agency as to, you know, is it going to be business as usual going forward? And so, I mean, I think what the, the questions are going to be going forward here, you know, what what is the future of this agency and what does this scandal and the, the, the questions it's raised, what do they mean for the, the broader question of how the state, the, the level of the state's involvement in regulating uh, liquor? Right. And so you touched on this a little bit earlier, but what sorts of responses have you gotten just from the, the general community um, since kind of breaking this story, you know, on top of the people directly uh, at the center of it? Yeah, this story has really touched a nerve with Oregonians. I've got a full email inbox and lots of phone calls from concerned taxpayers, members of the public, bourbon connoisseurs who are irritated to see this system benefiting a few. And, you know, I, th I think people are, you know, they're frustrated to see high-level officials apparently exploiting their positions uh, to gain access to something that most of us would have a really hard time finding access to. We're talking about, uh, in, the, in the case of the, the uh, safety stock, this is a kind of a line of bourbon that has a, um, like a cult-like following. Um, it's released once a year. Uh, it's distilled in Kentucky. Um, it has a kind of iconic um, status in pop culture. It was subject of, it was a, a heist involving Pappy Van Winkle <laughs> bourbon um, within the past decade that's you know, been turned into a Netflix series. And um, it was uh, also, I guess, the drink of choice on on the FX series Justified. Uh, so the brand is a familiar one to people, even people who don't drink bourbon, but particularly among those who drink bourbon. And what I learned in the course of reporting this is, you know, there's a kind of a whole intelligence network around, you know, when is this release going to happen? And, um, and how people secure these prized bottles uh, that are released in very limited quantities. And, so we're getting back to reader response, there, there's a sense of, you know, a, a kind of outrage um, that the public, you know, that people whose salaries are paid by the public are taking advantage of a, a system that should be benefiting the public. Um, and mm -hmm. so that I would say that is and, and, and also many readers questioning how does the state, does this make sense anymore to regulate the system as it is? Uh, now. And, you know, I think these are questions that we're going to explore going forward. I I think this story has raised a lot of really important questions about a really important agency, important because it generates so much in tax revenue. And so this story kind of is both, you know, it, it's this scandal involving bourbon, but it also is, is about how is this agency run and does that makes sense at this point. As a reporter, I'll just be asking those questions and obviously letting the public decide if, you know, what what they think about it. Yeah. I did kind of want to ask about that like larger significance because like as thorough as your reporting is, as wild as the story is, you know, reading through this, I kind of was like, all right, at the end of the day, it's a it's about bourbon. Like is there is it about anything more than, you know, a niche group of people who are really, you know, who really care about this. But beyond that, what's the point? But yeah, what do you think could be at play here if, you know, the OLCC's control over liquor is ultimately at some point overturned by voters or if something in that realm were to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think that this story just kind of reinvigorates that debate, which we've seen in the past. And um, I'm, I'm sure it will be, I'm sure that the people who would like to see it privatized will seize on it for those purposes. Um, 
But I do think that it, it, you're, you're you're right. On one hand, we're talking about a story about you know select bourbon and half a dozen people apparently involved in having it set aside. And so, you know, there is that that's that's the kind of the beginning of the story. And I think uh, you know that's obviously really important for us to report on and for the public to know about. Um, but I do think it's kind of a starting point for a broader examination of the policy and, you know, of the agency and, and its administration um, and, um, and, and, and the commission and, you know, and its, author- and its authority over the, over the agency. I mean, it, it, the, the story kind of begins with the bourbon scandal, but it's not really the end of, it's not the end of our reporting. Yeah. Only the beginning. Um, is there anything else you wanted to mention or hope readers take away from your reporting on this? You know, I think the story on a really basic level underscores the importance of uh, transparency and the state's public records law. We obtain this record through the public records law. Um, it's a really uh, important law that allows um, us to get a better idea of what the government is up to and provide that really critical role that we're supposed to provide as uh, as watchdogs of on state government and so i guess i'll just end with a shout out for for the law that allowed us to break the story <laughs> absolutely uh well noel thank you for your reporting and for coming on the show to talk about it thanks for having me i really appreciate it of course And thank you for listening to Beat Check with the Oregonian. If you haven't been keeping up with all of Noelle's stories and feel like you're missing out, you are. But don't worry, you can read up on all things OLCC at OregonLive.com. And as always, if you like our show, don't hesitate to make it known by leaving a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.